My presentation is called Heritage Shall Be Our Life Motif. Uh, as you can see, there's a picture, a symphony in green. It's a picture of our World Heritage sites, our World Heritage property uh, in Austria, one of the component sites of the UNESCO World Heritage of prehistoric pile dwellings around the Alps, which is, as you probably know, a transboundary, a transnational serial world heritage. And as you can see on this map, uh, all these little red dots are pile dwellings, pile dwelling find spots. Not all of them are on the list of the UNESCO World Heritage property but 111 of those little red dots are on the list. And our biggest challenge, probably, in the management of this world heritage, when I say we, is us in Austria as the Curatorium Ballbauten, the, like the management body of this world heritage site in Austria. But there is also, of course, in every country, there is a management body. And there is a joint group, the International Coordination Group, and all of the session organizers are part of this group. And so when when I say what is a big or when I ask what is the biggest from, from my point of view, what's the biggest challenge is how we can find this kind of golden thread in between this world heritage, this component site sites, because it's quite confusing and it's also a very large time frame. We have more or less four and a half thousand years maybe even more, of uh, prehistory. Six countries, different areas, different uh, landscape types. So it's quite complex. And how can we uh, do this? And are there good recipes for that? And when I designed my idea for the session, I had the idea that we will just make an online survey and find other places, other maybe older transnational sites. There are not so many there. 37 uh, inscribed sites or inscribed properties uh, in the group of 1,092 World Heritage sites, uh, all in all. And so I thought maybe it's easier, but it's good to ask the others, how do you deal with this context that you have a transnational site, you have to take care on the local conditions, the local context, but you have also bring everything together. What was kind of problematic is that when you look, for instance, at the uh, official World Heritage Center site, you have all the listings of the, of the inscribed sites. And uh, of all these 37, you can find only seven sites with a joint presentation. So, it's kind of limited. I thought every site, every World Heritage property should have or would have a joint management, a link, a website address where you can find more information and context. And it's not even possible to find the context for most of the World Heritage sites. So you, to give you a very quick overview, uh, there of these seven sites with a joint presentation, you can find, for instance, the Struve Geodetic Arc. Uh, they have something like a, a big heap. That's their joint presentation, which is already a little bit outdated. I think the last update was from 2010. Uh, you can find uh, presentations like uh, this one, the, the Venetian works of defense between 16th and 17th century of Italy and Croatia, I think. Um, but when you click on the continue button, then you end up on an Italian web page with uh, little information about the joint, the, 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 the World Heritage. You can find sites like this, the uh, Pyrenees Mont Perdu, uh, which is basically more a touristic site. And one of the few examples where it's really an attempt to bring everything together is this uh, natural heritage site, the, the Badensee between Germany Denmark and the Netherlands, who bring everything together and start uh, from a position of a joint world heritage. So I failed to have this online survey because I still need to get the context. 
So maybe there are some concepts, but you can't find them. That brings me back to our own web presentation. That's just a random uh, screenshot, which is, I have to confess, also something that uh, is in that form quite a recent status. So we already had from the very beginning a joint website, but uh, it was very much focused on the perspective of Switzerland. Switzerland as a lead partner in this nomination was kind of uh, uh, dominating this website. After more or less five or six years, we did it a little bit different, also recognizing that there should be a more balanced presentation of the joint world heritage. But um, what we, and we experienced that in all the countries, what, we, what is our daily life is that uh, people close by to the component parts, to the action sites, the find spots, they're only connected to their own heritage in front of their buildings, in front of their villages. So that's part of a research project that we did uh, uh, together with schools in Austria. It's uh, translated, uh, I, I tell that the people of uh, 6,000 6, years before already knew how beautiful it is to live here. Uh, that's a kind of culture that not everybody got and uh, you should see that. It's nice that we have something like this. Or it's important for the identity of the inhabitants or the, the locals uh, that they know they live in a very special region. So in many of these, we did a lot of interviews, or the school kids did a lot of interviews. In many of these quotes, uh, people refer to this local identity. And that's the only thing, that they never refer to a global identity, or a joint identity, or a common culture. So it's, it's very much focused and, uh, on the local level, which we can also use which is every now and then very useful. So for instance, also part of this research project was that we created or encouraged also local narratives. And uh, so we, for instance, there's a story about a knödel, a dumpling, which became part of the local heritage, uh, which is of course something that is, it, it is rooted in archeology span because they found something like a like a, uh, like a bread, remnants of bread, but uh, people made something new out of it. So it's very useful to start with these uh, local narratives, but on the other side, it's a little bit too limited and with, connected with many problems. Uh, in the preparation of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, there was also one of the many studies, preparation studies, this one is made from Markus E. Brutsch, European Identity, made for the European Parliament, and see, he said, accordingly, it would be most striking and e indeed irresponsible of nation states, but also the EU, were not to pers pursue any action or a even formalized policies aimed at strengthening collective identities. Identities, again. So, we're working with identities. But a little bit earlier, he already says, in a nutshell, no identity is stable over time or eternal, no identity is intrinsically superior to another, and no identity is indispensable. So, he already, in his report, is quite clear that the concept of identity is a very problematic one. Going back to the world heritage and the UNESCO, you can find another quote. Heritage constitutes of sources of identity and cohesion for communities disrupted by bewildering change and economic instability. Creativity contributes to building open, inclusive, and pluralistic societies. Both heritage and creativity lay the foundations for vibrant, innovative, and prosperous knowledge societies. So I thought it would be wise when you think about these additional dimensions of our heritage of especially a, a, a global heritage, when we think about bringing that to the next level, to look a little bit more on the 
identity aspect. What is clear, and I think most of us already touched this topic, is that heritage and archaeology in particular can act as means to create a local identity. It's very useful, as we did it with the dump links, that can put society together, opposing things like rural exodus, uh, but it's a very constructivistic concept. We all know that, I think, that uh, the concept of this local identity or cultural identity is very problematic. And it's, of course, and that's very important, also in the context of the global heritage, which should be something for all, it's very exclusive and very rarely inclusive. So I think um, we have to find a differentiation. And when we speak about identity, we should maybe define the terms, the terminology a little bit more. So quite often people speak about the cultural identity, but then maybe we should think much more about the personal, personal identity or the identification with something. To make it a little bit more clear, I brought some examples. So what is identification? That's a, um, what do you call it in English? Spindle um, Spindle word, thank you. Um, and I use that quite often for, for workshops. So I have a workshop with teenagers, also including teenagers with a migration background. And one of the guys was uh, from Tajikistan, I think, and he was very, closed, quiet, language problems. And when I showed this, and I just, my point was to, to ask the teenagers what they think, what kind of object is this, and most said, okay, it's a small wheel of a, I don't know, a model of a cart or something like this. But this guy immediately recognized it because his grandmother, she still uses a spinning wheel, wheel spindle wheel uh, to, for threads. So he found this as a home marker and he got an element to identify with this topic with the pile dwellings and the heritage of the pile dwellers. So that was something on a very personal level. And he had the chance to identify with that. And then the, the rest of the workshop, he was very open and uh, he really enjoyed the workshop. If you think about personal identity, how can people identify with uh, culture, that's a model of the Pine Dwelling House from France, that is kind, kind of difficult to approach. It's very far away. Isn't it much easier to identify with something much more recent? There are also skilled houses in Southeast Asia, Myanmar, for instance. So they're much closer, I would say. And maybe that's even closer having holidays in luxury stint house hotel in the Maldives. Maybe the, the persons there are much more identifi uh, identifiable for the persons, of, uh, for us, for people living in the I don't know, Austrian uh, pile dwelling areas than to identify with this very far past. And cultural identity is a concept, as I said already, that is not really existing because it's always connected to something that is created and very artificial. For instance, probably, I don't know how many in this room already saw the sound of music. Not so many, but if you go to Austria, almost nobody saw it. But if you ask any American, for instance, how, what would you, uh, from a cultural aspect, connect to Austria? Maybe the first thing, the first thing would be sound of music. So people start now in marketing to connect the pile dwelling with sound of music as a commercial package, but it's nothing that is connected to our Austrian cultural identity. So that's something that is very artificial and not useful. That's, I, that struck me all, always that uh, people who are very fond of their national identity or state nation identity, um, they refuse to identify with certain elements of this identity. 
So that's a quote from the German, former German president, Gauck. There is no German identity without Auschwitz. Um, and the guy who blocked this, he's a far right activist, uh, and he asks or tells this uh, president, remember that you have been elected as head of state to represent the German nation, people, and not to degrade it. So he's on one side always referring to the German identity, but he's neglecting this identification with part of it. It's I probably you will see other pictures of this uh, event. I have to hurry a little bit. Um, it's tempting to use identity and national identity, and we are also not immune to that. So we had this event. Uh, it's an international logboat uh, regatta where we bring together the whole group of uh, people involved uh, of, in the World Heritage, in the Pilot Dwelling Heritage. <laughs> and as you can see, we also as a team, we have the Austrian team, which is kind of contra contradictor contradictory, contradictory, um, because it should be on a different level. I will skip that because it's, I think, a, a presentation on its own. So <laughs> I just wanted to, to bring that in as a, maybe something that you can take home as well. Think about the World Heritage as places of otherness. Um, my last slides, just a little bit. Um, I think if we try to find a solution, how we can connect to the people and how we can describe, how we can talk about these cultures. What is a culture? But if we talk about the past, is that we maybe remind ourselves on our profession. Archaeologists are, as many people say, interpreters of the past. <laughs> so they are used to, to work with transformation, typologies, inter is the in-between, so you have a distance with room and space, time in between. And uh, there's a French uh, philosopher, François Julien, and he said, transformation is the root of culture, so it's impossible to fix a cultural identity in one place at one spot. So he is very strongly opposing the concept of a cultural identity, and he proposes um, that we should focus on the transformation, on the differ uh, not on the differences, which are like obstacles, and they are very static and isolating. But he says that if you think about space and distance in between and try to analyze it, then it's dynamic and brings the in-between into the light. So it's also, again, a piece of transformation that could help us to display cultural heritage. Coming back to the title, Heritage as a Light Motif, I would suppose or suggest that we, in our representation, interpretation, also when we do, I don't know, museums, exhibitions, and try new, think of new ways how to tell stories about the past, create a narrative, then we can think also Imagine this heritage as a piece of music. As a, that's also something that we always discussed in the world heritage together. Can we find a, something like a common general narrative as a foundation, as a basis? And when you think as this common leitmotiv, uh, as, as this, this basis, then that could help us to create something new. And there are also room for deviations, two of my favorite of the past, uh, stone tools in new design with uh, 3D printed handles, or these uh, hipster Greek sculptures. So you can find a more, I don't know, not so serious way to talk about heritage. So to conclude my, my thoughts about identity and heritage, I would suggest that we cherish the distance, not the distinction and create open ends into the future, because that's also something that is really strongly connected to this idea of having a transformation and, and more something that is uh, 
not separated and put into separated pieces. And also to try to find easy access for heritage, create a soundtrack for identification. Thank you very much.